either might be able to maintain eight employees, seven employees, and keep the uh, health insurance, or uh, keep all the employees and just let the uh, health insurance go for, for a while. Scared. I was really scared that I was going to lose my home. And they're filling up at 85 a tank full, and that, that really hurts. It really hits home for me. I'm realizing, wow, it's 85 bucks. Significant. Stuck with a subprime loan? Struggling to fill your gas tank? Rolling the dice when it comes to health insurance? Tonight, we'll take a look at these problems and bring you some solutions. You'll learn how to spot a predatory loan and what to do if you already have one. Hear about a new program that will give 25,000 Silicon Valley adults access to affordable health insurance. And find out why the cars that could save the planet will probably be built here. When will you be able to drive one? Find out tonight on the State of the Silicon Valley. I'm Deborah Villalone. Each year, Joint Venture brings together some of the region's most innovative minds for the State of the Valley Conference. These local leaders take stock and tackle the pressing problems in our community. This year, the subprime lending crisis, health care, the electric car industry, and globalization were some of the issues under discussion. Reporter Paul Rogers spoke with Russell Hancock, president and CEO of Joint Venture at this year's event, to get his view on the current economy. Russ, uh, summing up uh, the report that you've uh, delivered to the conference here, what would you say is the state of Silicon Valley? What's going well? What isn't going so well? Well, it's a classic economist report. There's on the one hand, there's on the other hand. But I want to stress, on the one hand, Silicon Valley is thriving. Uh, I want to be very clear about this. We've, we're adding jobs, 28,000 jobs added to the economy over the past 12 months. Uh, venture funding way up, patent generation way up, uh, worker productivity, uh, the, the performance of our companies on the stock market. All of these things are actually fabulous, the kind of performance that any region would envy. So everything you need to have in place to be a technology economy, to be innovative, that's here. It's happening in Silicon Valley. will continue happening. Here's the other hand. The thing that folks are worried about are the volatility out there. There's volatility in the financial markets. There's a subprime lending crisis. And there's globalization. And that has an impact on this region, no question. And it's changing the nature of the marketplace, changing the nature of the workforce, the pressures on that, uh, that mid-range workforce. That's what we're seeing. And so we're here today to talk about what we do about it. What are some of the ideas that are coming out about what we should do about it? Because certainly one of the things that's come forward in this conference is that some folks uh, at the top are doing very well and then there's a lot of stress with middle income workers. So what do we do about uh, making it more equitable? Well, first of all, understand that this is being driven by globalization. Globalization is here to stay. That's not, that's not going to be leaving us anytime soon. So to be competitive in a workforce like this, you have to be ready to offer yourself up with a very particular skill set. You need to be specialized. You need to be highly qualified in a niche. You need to offer yourself to employers as the best person doing that kind of thing. Because understand, employers are not adding to their headcount in the way that they used to. Employers are globalizing their workforce, and the kinds of talent that they're using here locally, they're doing it on a contract basis. So quick contracts for somebody who's going to fill a particular function, and then they move on to the next function. Uh, companies aren't integrating horizontally the way that they used to. They aren't integrating vertically the way that they used to. So this is a new, a new dynamic. It's, uh, I would say, even a new form of capitalism that's emerging in Silicon Valley. We haven't seen uh, the last of this. Talk a little bit about some of the opportunities. I mean, one of the buzzes always in Silicon Valley is, what's the next big thing? What's the next new thing? Um, as you look ahead over the next couple of years, what are two or three of the sectors that you see that have real promise? Paul, here's what's interesting. Previous waves have been characterized by a single thing, right? Computers, semiconductors, uh, the internet, software. What's interesting about Silicon Valley right now is that it's actually a very diverse uh, package. We've got clean technology, solar technology, alternative fuels. Uh, we have biotech, nanotech and their convergence, and medical devices, those kinds of things. And then we have, of course, our bread and butter, information technology. And that's moving into these new areas like uh, ubiquitous internet, mobile, mobile computing, the Wi-Fi, the WiMAX. These are all burgeoning areas for Silicon Valley. And we're not concentrated on any one of them. That's a good thing. 
Well, the region has seen some steady job growth in recent years, yes. um, but we're still not quite at where we were in 2000 at the top of the tech bubble. Uh, we also have a median household income, which isn't quite where we were. So are we all the way recovered yet from the tech bubble, or how do you characterize that? Well, I characterize it completely differently. Uh -huh. The tech bubble was not real. That just wasn't real. We, uh, it, that was the engine overheating, and we went through this period of excess and a lot of hype, and we got to get over that. It's like some of us need therapy to get, to get past that. <laughs> Uh, what's real is what we have now, which is an economy that's firing on most of its cylinders. Uh, it, uh, we're adding to our workforce. We're creating these opportunities in these uh, diversified areas of tech. Uh, you're not going to see prodigious job growth. That will never happen in Silicon Valley again because the jobs are going to be globalized. What we're going to see in Silicon Valley is incremental growth, steady as she goes from here on out. Globalization was a common theme at this year's conference. The earmarks of globalization are free trade, free flow of capital, and the tapping of cheaper foreign labor markets. It's part of the reason our high-tech economy is so strong. It's also a part of the reason the middle-class families are wondering if they can afford to live here anymore. Mid-wage jobs are disappearing, and home prices are well beyond the average worker's paycheck. It's no surprise many were tempted to buy homes with subprime loans, a product touted as a way to help first-time home buyers get a foot in the door of the American dream. FDIC Chair Sheila Baer was a keynote speaker at State of the Valley Conference. Reporter Paul Rogers asked her to explain what went so wrong. Certainly in the news, housing has been a big story uh, in the last year and will be for the year ahead. Uh, for folks who haven't been paying very close attention, how would you explain to them the causes? Is it that we had a lot of deceptive lending or too many people who bought houses they just couldn't afford? Well, I think it's a combination. Uh, we certainly had a lot of lax lending. Uh, there were some cases of deception and abuse as well. Uh, but lending, standings, uh, lender, lending standards uh, deteriorated uh, significantly, uh, beginning really about 2002, 2003, it really started taking off. Uh, and this was facilitated by rising home prices in a low interest environment. So uh, lenders started making unaffordable loans, basically loans that could not be uh, afforded on the long term uh, by borrowers. But the borrowers would just refinance out of those uh, mortgages when the payment uh, hikes uh, kicked in because they could with the home price appreciation. Once the home price appreciation stopped, the music stopped, and now we're having uh, the problems that we're, uh, we're facing. And yes, I think there were some uh, borrowers who uh, just did not understand the complex mortgages that they received. We frequently see that in the subprime market. There are others that were taking uh, very calculated leverage bets, uh, but at the end of the day, we just have a lot of unaffordable mortgages out there. We need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. In California, the number of foreclosures in the last year has increased sixfold. Um, how much more pain do you think there's going to be in, in this state and across the country? Is this something that's going to be out of the system by the end of this year? Or how, how much more do you think we have to go? Well, I hope so. Uh, the payment reset problem is going to extend into 2009, both for subprime and then these, also these Alt-A loans. So these are interest-only loans or payment option arm loans uh, that negatively amortize. The payment shocks will continue, um, and so we need to have a, a prolonged, concerted effort to modify these loans. Uh, my view is that if you're making the starter rate and on the subprime loans, these are very high rates to begin with and can't make the reset, the servicers should modify the loans just to maintain the starter rate uh, to keep that group of borrowers in their houses. The problem is if we keep having mass foreclosures, that's going to put more and more downward pressure on the housing market. So I think systematic modifications is really a key part of this process. But if we do that, I, I think and hope we will be working our way out of it by the end of the year.